Hello, everyone. I'm Kat Timpf, along with Eric Bowling and Ebony K. Williams. We are the Fox News Specialists. It was all stick and no carrots for Republican senators at the White House today. They're feeling the heat from President Trump after their effort to repeal and replace Obamacare imploded yesterday. I've been here just six months. I'm ready to act. I have pen in hand. Believe me, I'm sitting in that office. I have pen in hand. You never had that before. You know, for seven years, you had an easy route. We'll repeal, we'll replace, and he's never going to sign it. But I'm signing it. So it's a little bit different. But I'm ready to act. People are hurting. Inaction is not an option. And frankly, I don't think we should leave town unless we have a health insurance plan, unless we can give our people great health care, because we're close. We're very close. The White House announcing that Republican senators are gathering on Capitol Hill this evening to try and bring repeal and replace back from the dead. But should voters have any faith after Republican leaders botch this so badly? What do you think, Eric? Is tonight going to be the night? So something very important happened today. Mitch McConnell came to the uh, speaker and he said, look, we're going to figure out which bill we're going to go ahead and push next week. And that's important because originally it was that big bill that no one really liked. And then it was going to be just the, the clean repeal that Rand Paul and the others like. Look, if you pass the big bill that no one likes, you're going to... Republicans, you're going to get hurt in 2018, period. I'm just, I'm war fair warning right now. If you pass nothing at all, you're going to get hurt in 2018. Another warning. What you really have to, the only choice forward and the most logical one and the most sensible one for the American people is pass the clean repeal now and then spend the next two years with the, a good replacement bill that encompasses the four things that conservatives have complained for eight years about. State line, uh, being able to have competition across state lines, drug pricing, tort reform, and hospitals uh, posting their prices online. Get that done, and you're, you're a winner in 18 and a winner in 20. I agree with that. Ebony, you look like you disagree a little bit. Um, well, I agree that the four things Eric is talking about are exactly what should have been in the first big bill. But uh, here's what I think. I think if they don't replace it, if they do the clean repeal, but they don't have anything in place, I think there still might be damage in 2018 because I can see the ads rolling now from the Democrats. They're going to have grandma going off the cliff. They're going to have children die and say this is what happens when the Republicans half do something, when they take something away and offer nothing in its place. That's going to certainly be the narratives that the Dems will run with in 2018. And I think it'll be damaging. All right. Well, let's meet today's specialists. She's a former anchor for One America News Network. She's one of the most provocative conservative commentators in the country, and she's the senior communications advisor for the Great America Alliance, the largest pro Trump political action committee. But she specializes in melting snowflakes with her viral final thoughts commentary on Facebook. Tommy Laren is here. And he's a conservative commentator. He's won 70 awards for journalism from the Associated Press, Society of Professional Journalists, the National Press Club, and he's the host of the nationally syndicated Lars Larson Show. So he specializes in all things radio. Lars Larson is here. Lars, what do you think about how this healthcare thing's been going? Not great. No, Not listen, great. I got to tell you, Kat, a lot of conservatives are starting to feel like Ann Coulter on a Delta flight. We bought the <laughs> ticket, we got the promise, and now all of a sudden flight attendants, uh, Paul Ryan, Lisa Murkowski are back saying, get out of the seat. We're not going where you wanted to go anymore. And meanwhile, up front, you've got, uh, you know, Susan Collins and Mitch McConnell, and they don't know how to fly to the state of independence anymore, independence from government regulation of health care. Mm. So they're going to take you to Rhino land instead. I want them to do something. And if it means... OK, we're going to clean repeal two years. You now have a hard deadline to come up with somebody to replace it. That's probably the best way to go if you can't get some sensible replacement right now. And it doesn't sound like they can. Tommy, I like the repeal and then have it phased out and have the two years to come up with something. What do you think about that idea? I do as well, because it gives you a deadline and then Republicans better act. It lights a fire and they need that fire, as we have seen. They were so confident that they could repeal and replace. They were so confident they could just repeal back when they were campaigning. And now what? They worked so hard to get elected, and now what? Now everyone that voted for them 
Come on. And this, I think that's the narrative, right, Tommy, is that if you're a Democrat in 2018, you're going to go out to all of the constituents and you're going to say, you guys gave them a chance. They had seven years to get this thing right. And they, and I think President Trump, by the way, is right to hold their feet to the fire and hold them accountable. He's got pen in hand. He's ready to go. He should not be in a position right now as the commander in chief, the first Republican in the Oval in eight years, and not have legislation that can move. But that's the ridiculous. The alternative, Ebony, is if they don't do anything, we know they're not going to get the bill. They're not going to get the full health care law no. bill, bill passed into law. Mm -hmm. So if they don't do anything, they're going to go into 2018 and, and, and feel the fire <clears throat> even, worse. even worse. So here's, the, here's the counter to going to 2018 with just the repeal and the replacement underway. Mm -hmm. They say the alternative was letting Obamacare last. Right now, they're, right now today, there are 38 counties in America with no insurers. Mm -hmm. They're going to be something like 30 percent of the country with one insurer by 2018. These are numbers that American people are, 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 are suffering under because their health care costs are... Uh, insurance are, uh, costs Going are up. rising. I agree so with you, if Eric. You, if, and you go, look, I know we didn't replace yet, but if we left Obamacare in there, then you would have been even Here's more no, no, no. One thing, Kat, if I hear you, Eric, but then there's, they're going to find those people that right now under these sky-high premiums still have something, that people have Obamacare. And if you do a clean repeal and they have nothing, that those does, are going to be would the be a gradual phasing that out. Doesn't happen. I'm just, that's going to be the ad. No, but, I'm just telling you. Yeah, but that, there, there is no one, literally no one going to be left without insurance. I mean, that, but you know if, that's going to be the narrative. Well, Politically, the, only people, at messaging, the only people yeah. that are going to be left without insurance are the ones who choose not to buy insurance right. or take or and shouldn't they, they and have take that right the, to choose. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I see the right them. to choose there, I think, is the right thing to do. Right. I think in ah. this case, you're telling, well, just a little <laughs> shot, sorry, Lars. Ebony, but there, it's, does, it's not just about killing babies. It's actually about having the government say, we're not going to force you to do something. I'm that, all about that choice. You, I like you it. You don't choose to do it. Yeah. And there are people who do choose to go bare for all kinds of insurance mm -hmm. this should be one of them if that's your choice and okay. it makes for a great marketplace because then insurance companies you know say we got to come up with something well, I'm, to I'm, sell. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm sorry hey. Tommy you know what the problem is this is what happens when the government takes over things that should have stayed in the private sector oh absolutely thank you John Roberts and not our Ooh. not a reporter I'm talking about <laughs> the I, was like, I, I would like to thank John Justice, Roberts John great Roberts. guy well, the messaging has to get better we need to tell better stories because you're right the Democrats have great stories they're gonna have great ads we need to have better ads in the words of President Donald J Trump we need to do it better we need to do it quickly and we need to light a fire because if not we give them more time more time more time give them a deadline and say you need to do something or else guess what 2018 you're out anyway something's coming Kat Something is coming. If Mitch McConnell says there is going to be a vote next week, he knows one of these two are going to pass. My guess, the one, the repeal, the clean repeal only, is the one that's closest to passing. I think he only needs to turn two people. I, Mitch McConnell's got something going. Well, we'll see. I mean, we've talked before. You've talked about letting it implode on its own, and I think that that's terrible because the narrative there is, okay, let it implode, and then we can fix it then. But there's no telling whether or not Republicans will be in a position to fix it, because that could be something that takes a while. You, when 2018 comes when, along, when I say, Democrats when I say let it have implode, control at that point. I mean, let Obamacare implode. I don't mean put people out in the street without I insurance. completely understand that, but I'm talking about Obamacare as well. If we let it implode, there's with the idea that we could fix it after it implodes, but it might well, not be Democrats Republicans be that control for Republicans of Congress. To fix it but it, I highly it, it, doubt we'd the have the same continue. solutions for how to fix it. And I agree, it. and what's the fix then? Single payer? Single payer, Wait. exactly. That's right. exactly what I'm that's concerned what Mark, about. That's what Mark Levin has said. Talking, that's what I'm saying, Eric. I, I love your vote of confidence in Mitch McConnell. I just can't share it because I don't have any indication, any reason, no evidence, no facts to indicate to me that he's got anything better than he's had for the past seven years. Because Our, he has uh, repeal, and he's only... Uh, uh, the way I, the, the numbers, if John McCain comes back in time for the vote, which it looks like he might, mm -hmm. that means there are three people who are holding out right now. If he gets one to agree to it, he's got 50 and he's got, he's got uh, Vice President Pence, Pence to break the tie. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, honestly, guys, politically, it's the only answer right now. Right only right now. a three. You might be right right now. All right. Well, speaking of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, he's facing a growing insurrection from more conservatives after the health care bill's failure and are raising questions about whether he is fit for the job at all.
He doesn't seem to be down with the president's agenda. I mean, where's the wall? Where's tax reform? Where's Obamacare repeal? These are all things that go to the Senate and then they suddenly die. It's not like there aren't the votes in the Senate to get them passed. And, you know, we can't even blame filibuster for this because the way they structured Obamacare repeal, you only needed 50 votes plus the vice president. And they can't even get that with Mitch McConnell, who's telling liberals in the Senate one thing, liberal Republicans one thing, telling conservative Republicans something else. And then when they get together in the same room, they realize they've been told completely completely different things. Ooh, Mitch McConnell. Is wow. this all Mitch McConnell's? But not a popular guy right now. I'm Certainly not a fan not. of him. I, I'm oh, not neither a fan. am I. No, listen, I don't think he's done his job. I don't think Ryan's done his job properly either. But something has to get done about this whole mess. And Eric, I like a lot of my callers will say, let's let it implode. The problem is there's too much human damage that comes from that. But the clean repeal with a two year sunset gives you the attractive parts of the implosion, but it puts you on a deadline and says you have to get something done. Nothing Congress does is on a deadline anymore. They don't have to, we all have to get our work done and be here at the right time. They don't. A two-year two uh, replace for it puts them on a deadline and make it such that they can't extend the two years. Well, that's, that's the big thing, but remember this is the same discussion we had with the sequester as well. That was supposed to push people to get something done and yet nobody got anything done. I think President Trump's gonna be the person though, of all people. He's going to be the one getting him in the room. And if anyone's going to listen to anyone, it's going to be Congress listening to President Trump because a lot of them rode on his coattails into office. And so if they want to. I'm not so sure about that, though, because no, I think that the GOP, I think that the GOP doesn't know who the GOP is anymore. It's I think Donald that there's Trump. people with very different views in Congress. So I don't know if it's a matter of them needing to get it done. There's certain people who aren't going to agree to certain things no matter what. Look, if you're I, I'm, I said this yesterday and I did a whole thing on it. Um, if you're a Republican senator who's going to vote against repealing only Obamacare, you're going to get primaried. And guess yeah. what happens when you get primary? Donald J. Trump is going to go to your district and say, or your state, and say, hey, I really needed you to do this. Guess what happens yeah. to you? You're done. You're that's, finished. That's he hinted that today. Yeah. And we know and he's done it before. Meeting. He has precedents for calling people out by name that stand in the way of his Make America Great Again agenda. And that's probably the strongest leverage he has, Eric. I'll also say this. Perhaps this is the time. I think, I disagree with you, Kat. I think the GOP is plainly Donald Trump's party. I don't think there's any contention around that if we really be intellectually honest here because uh, the GOP hasn't gotten it done in eight years. And finally, they're in a position to do so, even though they're failing to act right now. I'll also say this. I really think perhaps the president has to be more hands-on at this point. I think he let Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan try. They batted two for zero. Maybe the president needs to get in front of this legislation himself. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what it being President Trump's party means. I, I mean, in terms of health care, the fact that the no votes came from people with two very different views and for very different reasons is what I I'm mean saying when a strong I say hold, that they don't know Pat, who I'm saying a stronghold where President when Trump we're talking gets about out votes. here and says, you all are in the position you're in off the strength of my coattails, much like many Democrats were in 08 behind Obama. So let's call a spade a spade and get in line, get in formation, as some people might say. Uh, two, two quick thoughts. Uh, Ebony, it's 0 for 2, not 2 for oh, 0. Oh, excuse me. Excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> Elbow, uh, uh, yes, yes, like 0 that. for 2. Uh, and and, and for also, two. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, again, in that go that... I think this is completely on Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan's shoulders. There are five people in the House who put this, uh, this, their health care version uh, together, and there are a handful of people. They're all leadership, and they led the president astray. They said, we have this, and they never had it. This right. is not Trump care. Can't Get be Trump it together, care. guys. He's got his pen. <laughs> all right. Up next, rampant speculation consuming the mainstream media after an unknown Trump-Putin meeting is revealed. We're coming right back. Like sort of. A second meeting between President Trump and Vladimir Putin at this month's G20 summit in Germany has newly been revealed and, as you imagine, already causing quite a controversy and conspiracy theories. It's the president himself who may have made this look sinister. Reporters, foreign policy analysts, and our allies can safely assume the worst. They can safely assume the worst of Donald Trump. They can safely assume the worst of Vladimir Putin. What did he give away? 
in that hour that he was unsupervised? What did he give away without understanding that he was giving away? It is abnormal and it is not, is not appropriate for his duty. And then not to disclose it only arouses further suspicions about what the hell is it Donald Trump's obsession with Vladimir Putin and why won't he be why won't he be straightforward about it? It makes you wonder what's the unfinished business that the president decided yeah. he needed to transact after his after his initial meeting. All right. So amid the very wild speculation, the president's supporters, well, they're giving a more sober assessment. Suddenly a public meeting in front of literally 18 other heads of state suddenly becomes some secret weird event. And I think it's just part of the anti-Trump hysteria. OK, Tommy, Newt Gingrich, there, kind of referring to Trump, uh, just absolute crazy syndrome that we're seeing all over the place. And I got to tell you, I think there are lots of places to legitimately criticize President Trump. That's my opinion. But I think when anti-Trumpers or the Democrats or whoever go on this type of hysterical tangent, they not only do themselves a disservice, Tommy, uh, our specialist yesterday, David Avella, asked during a break, Ebony, when are the Dems going to let this uh, Russia thing go? I said, well, they're not, David, because they need a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And when you don't have a message that resonates with the American people, particularly economically, this is what they have. Well, you don't have policy positions or an actual agenda. You just talk about Russia mm. all day. And, you know, they talked about an obsession there. They talked about President Trump's obsession with President Putin. I think it's more the mainstream media's obsession with President Trump and Putin. There's the obsession, as you can see. They were almost crying there. It's really kind of sad. Yeah, it's, it's absolute derangement at this point, right, Nar? Well, Ebony... It, these people act like they've never been to a dinner before. You, all of the people sitting at this table have been to dinners before where you might stand up during the dinner, walk over and chat with somebody. And usually it's about nothing consequential. In fact, Tommy Lahren and I had a secret meeting because we both gave speeches at a political group about a, week, about a month ago. And during that dinner, we stepped aside and exchanged pleasantries for a couple of minutes. Nothing of consequence at all. And by the way, I'm not obsessed with Tommy Lahren. So does this... Well, you this, might be the only one. But it was a secret meeting. It wasn't on the agenda. <laughs> and I never later talked about what we said. It was nothing. And this is nothing. You thought Spicer was exaggerating when he talked about the Russian salad dressing. This is how deranged the mainstream media is about everything. Donald Trump as it relates to Russia. Yeah, Kat, I mean, you've been, I think, consistent on your position that you have questions and you want answers, but when you see stuff like this, what's your take? Right, exactly. I'm somebody who would like to see the investigation continue, particularly for the reason of the changing stories. Whenever you start changing your story, I start looking at your story closer, no matter who you are, no matter what it is about. But I think it's strange to even really call this a meeting at all. They were all at dinner, and then he talked to him for a while. I would obviously have preferred there to be an American there rather than just going through the Kremlin translator because then they, they control the narrative. However, I think the only person who should have a very serious problem with this might be the Japanese prime minister's wife who had to sit there alone because <laughs> President Trump got up and then she had, what is a, what is a leaders and couples dinner anyway? Bowling. Well, what do you, you do kinda... if you don't have a husband or wife? What do you do? Can you not go or do you just bring a date? I don't even know where to, know where real to start. Question. So Melania Trump was sitting next to uh, Vladimir Putin. Yeah. They, they didn't need a translator. She was sitting right there. And uh, so let's go back. Yeah, there, there's a picture. I, I'm so glad producers put this up. This, David Frum, you stupid dolt, you call this an unsupervised meeting? Right. Look at this. There are probably 80 people at that table. There are cameras. We can see everything. This isn't, and you notice, I, I'm going to call out Ian Bremmer too. Ian Bremmer is the guy who, quote unquote, broke the story. Mm -hmm. You broke what story, Ian? That there was a, a dinner and Donald Trump walked around shaking hands with world leaders, sat down with, with, Putin for an hour. You, this is the story that you quote unquote broke. You know, he didn't have the, the guts, <laughs> he didn't have the guts to call it a bilateral meeting because it wasn't because it was a group of 80 some people yeah. at that table. This is much ado about nothing. Propaganda media. It's not even mainstream media anymore. It's just pure propaganda. Yeah, well, I think they're certainly selling their soul. They being the mainstream media for this. Speaking of Brimmer. Ian Bremmer, the head of the Eurasia Group, quote, broke the story about the second Trump-Putin meeting. Got to use so many air quotes there. He gave his take about it earlier today. I think the concern is less uh, about wanting the U.S. and Russia to have a more functional relationship. Um, it's more about the dangers of Trump by himself without a lot of foreign policy expertise being played. 
I mean, okay, that's his take, I guess, but that's reading a lot into it, right? I mean, and look, again, I want to be clear about my concerns. I think flattery does get certain people certain places with President Trump. That's been a concern I've had, but I don't think we can project uh, a conclusion around what the business was going on between President Trump and Vladimir Putin. Well, no, and I don't understand why is it a bad thing to have our leader engage with other world leaders? I mean, Hillary and Barack Obama's Russia restart, that failed. So maybe if we have better relations with Russia, I don't see where that's a negative thing. No, I understand and I agree with you. I think that there are unanswered questions, mm -hmm. but when they spend all their time talking about how many scoops of ice cream, who sat at what table, who talked to who, this is high school. This is the mainstream media effectively back in high school, and it detracts from any kind of legitimacy they would otherwise have. When, well, I, every, yeah. what, what, when I hear I'm secret sorry. meeting, if someone invited me to a secret private meeting and I walked into that, I'd be very disappointed. Oh, yeah, all those cameras. <laughs> Look, am I the only one, one who thinks, yeah, a Russia investigation? How about the radioactive one, the one that left 20 percent of our uranium re production, not reserves, in the hands of Russia and where tens of millions of dollars changed hands? But that one involves Hillary Clinton. So that one's hands off. Why? Because she lost. She and her husband are not still significant figures within the Democrat Party. Well, how about an investigation of that? No, we're going to talk about whether or not Trump and Putin talked at a dinner. That wasn't the secret meeting between Trump and Putin. You want to know what a secret meeting really looks like? When a former president no, boards the airplane on the Here tarmac in yes, Arizona how did we know? and sits down <laughs> with the one-on-one -on -one with the active attorney general who may be investigating. You know what? As way. a libertarian, that I'm allowed be, to be mad at both all of these things. Questions media. about it all. As an American, we could even be I, mad I, at I all. That's the goal. <laughs> so straight that's ahead, goal. it is time to wake up, America. A new wave of gun violence swamps Chicago. And what's the city doing about it? Well, laying off prosecutors. Eric Bowling says enough is enough. Stay with us. It's time to wake up America. My hometown of Chicago, folks, this breaks my heart to say, but Chicago is literally a war zone. Here are the facts. Homicides are skyrocketing, 369 so far just this year. And get this, a war-torn country of 32 million people, Afghanistan, has less violent deaths per 100,000, which is 5.19, than Chicago, America's third largest city, of 2.72 million at a rate of 13.5. That's less than half. In Afghanistan. What's happening? I'll tell you what's happening. Liberal Democrats are happening. Mayor Rahm Emanuel is a complete failure. Rahm was in over his head from the get-go. At the beginning of his term, Emanuel eliminated the mobile strike force and targeted response units over budget issues. As the violence started to spike, Rahm hired Eddie Johnson, basically a yes man, who defended all the foolish liberal policies Rahm could cook up. Rahm, Eddie, and the ACLU placed Massive restrictions on how officers were allowed to make contact with suspects. When they do make a perfectly legal stop, officers are required to pump out mounds of bureaucratic paperwork. According to John Lott, a friend and a gun issue expert, Chicago has a detective force that is undermanned and overextended, struggling against reluctant prosecutors and a notorious no-snitch code. The results have been deadly. In 1991, 67% of murders were arrested. Under Rahm Emanuel, it hit a new low of 20% in 2016. Shocking, isn't it? Only one in five murders are cleared. Not much of a deterrent, is it? When you have an 80% chance of not getting caught. Chicago ground zero for Chicago's tsunami of murder, armed robbery, and assault is not the west and south sides of Chicago. Nope, ground zero sits right there in City Hall. Wake up, Chicago. Empower law enforcement to enforce the law. Spend the money to break up the gangs and lock up the criminals. And for God's sake, get rid of the Rom and Eddie show or continue this failed progressive experiment and watch the body counts continue to skyrocket. Tommy, um, Chicago, I'm calling it a law enforcement handcuff uh, environment, uh, handcuffed by liberals. Perfect case study into what's going on and it's going to start happening all across the country, I believe. Now, we just experienced an anniversary in Dallas of what happens when police officers are undermined and when police officers are not respected. And I think that there's a resurgence of support, but also in many cities like Chicago, you don't see that. And John Lott is absolutely right on this. And if we don't support our police officers, we don't give them the support that they need, we don't give them the morale that they need, Chicago is just a perfect example of what's going to happen all across the country. Yeah, and Ebony, uh, I pointed out that Ron Emanuel, the two major gang task force, he shut down over budget constraints. I don't care 
what's going on in your city, the most important thing is keeping that city safe. I completely agree with that. You know, I am no fan of Ron Emanuel on this and a host of issues, including education. But Eric, I do want to say this. Uh, I hear where you're coming from in the monologue, but we had thousands of law enforcement in droves on Chicago streets just a couple of weeks ago, and they didn't really see any better results. So I, I'm, I'm nervous, and, and, it, and it breaks my heart. I was in Chicago not even a year ago, six months ago, to see this for myself, this carnage. It is a nightmare. It is horrible. School kids are being killed, community workers. This is every day. But uh, my mother was concerned because she said, you're going to Chicago, you got to be careful, as if I was going to Iraq or Paris or some other terrorist uh, target. And, and, and Kat, we know that these, these areas of the west side and the south side of Chicago, that's where a vast majority of this crime is being committed. So there are ways to fix this, but certainly not if, if a police officer with a perfectly legal engagement with a, a suspect or perp has to do a, a massive amount of paperwork to, to write that up afterwards. Right. I also think it's important to note on a macro level that a lot of these are drug-related crimes, meaning that they come from the violence that comes from the black market that's associated with drugs being illegal in the war on drugs. I think that on a, so, ending, yeah, a but, good thing to reduce violence listen, would be legalized I, I, drugs. I'm with you on that, but they, these are homicides. These are murders, and I know they're over a lot of uh, you know, gang uh, turf, but in the 80s, there was massive gang uh, violence going on in, in L.A., and they broke that up by inst instituting these, these gang task forces. I'm, I'm, all about, I'm all about the police doing their job. I'm also just saying on a macro level, there's a reason why this it's violence systemic. You're comes from systemic. yeah exactly yeah. there's a reason why you have the violence in the black market there's a reason why there aren't jack daniels and makers mark truck drivers knifing it out in the streets and it's because it's legal okay. well look you you, you that's the third largest city arguably the third largest city shouldn't have the number one rate it should be new york or los angeles why isn't it i think new york has still got the holdover of some previous good mayors who had great policies now i don't think de blasio is great but how about some practical suggestions number one if the cook county prosecutor's office won't handle this and won't keep prosecutions up then why don't you have the doj step in and i'm not the biggest fan of having the federal government come in but if Sessions said fine if you won't take those cases locally we'll prosecute them federally that's number one number two you kid me about being a fan of concealed carry i'm not carrying here because of the crazy new york rules on carry but i do at home I think if you could liberalize some of those rules, but that may have to get through the Illinois legislature, that would be one way to address it. Let me bring this around the table again one more time. Uh, but here's the issue, that 20% number, Tommy, that's very, very scary. The number, the rate of murders who are arrested, 20%, four out of five aren't arrested in Chicago. What message does that send? I mean, it's, it's the message more than anything. You're right, there's no deterrent that exists. And they know if there's lawlessness, they know that people aren't empowered to keep this, the streets safe. They know that lawlessness is a status quo and it's accepted. That's just going to continue because who's going to put a clamp down on it? Okay. No one. Two things. I worked as a public defender, so I know what these freezes look like. Uh, this one going on right now in Cook County, laying off almost 40 people from okay. the uh, state prosecutor's office, including almost 20 actual DAs. It's a problem. And I've been on the receiving end of that freezing, and it really ties the hand of the justice system as we know it. It can't move. It's already a slow-moving thing. Now it's held to a screeching halt. But the issue, Eric, you talk about the, the mounds of bureaucratic paperwork. I, I do think it's important, though, that when there are good legal stops that happen every day, that they do cite their reasons, right? That's why we have a constitution. That's why we have, you know, what's, what was your reasonable Ebony, suspicion you know what most of that paperwork's it? about? I've talked to John a lot about yeah. this. Most of it is about political correctness. They I'm not talking about that, though, Lars. No, but I'm most talking of that about paperwork. just straight up and down. When you stop yeah. somebody and you have a reasonable suspicion, you just say what it is. That's, that's, that's nice and clean. You make a very good point that when the mm -hmm. prosecutor's office gets shrunk, that does put a backlog. Absolutely. They have detectives mm -hmm. who are working 20 murder cases at the same time saying, I can't go and They don't have the manpower. They don't have the manpower. I'm with you. What is more important than more manpower stopping murder in I'm your with city. you. Uh, it's, it's, Can we agree it's Rahm Emanuel is a failed mayor? Agreed there completely I agree with on that. many levels. I agree with we that. Agree. I agree that Rahm Emanuel is a terrible mayor. I agree <laughs> that I'm anti-murder and very bold stance, strictly anti-murder and also legalize all drugs. Okay, we'll leave it right there. Agree with that. Coming up, <laughs> President Trump's voter fraud panel convening for the very first time today. And the president is taking a big swing at critics. Don't go away. Welcome back to the Fox News Specialists. Our specialists today are Tommy Laren and Lars Larson. All right, let's keep this going. President Trump firing back at critics of his voter fraud commission in Washington today. 
any form of illegal or fraudulent voting, whether by non-citizens or the deceased, and any form of voter suppression or intimidation must be stopped. I'm pleased that more than 30 states have already agreed to share the information with the Commission and the other states that information will be forthcoming. If any state does not want to share this information, one has to wonder what they're worried about. And I asked the Vice President, I asked the Commission, what are they worried about? There's something. There always is. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Earlier, the panel convened for its first official meeting, but can it actually get answers given the fierce opposition to it? Eric, I know some of the concern has been with the security of the information. A lot of cybersecurity experts were concerned about that. Yeah, this, I, I, I think this, this is tre uh, treating voter suppression, intimidation. There's a very simple answer to this, and I'm just going to end it right here with my commentary. It's voter ID. Require voter ID and you solve all your problems. Anybody disagree? No, with that? not not at all. In fact, the, all the data they're asking for is already publicly available. No, it's not, Lars. Yes, the social it is. security numbers are not publicly available. It depends right? on the state, but it's all decided at the state level. Now, does but anybody want to find out if for. people are falsely registering to vote? Because we've found good examples in various states all over America where people Ooh, are falsely Lord. registered, and the Democrats have run steam uh, boiler rooms where they they find, sign up Mickey Mouse and the entire roster of okay. NFL. Okay, okay. Lost, 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 lost. We have to ahead, weigh it. Though, right against and I'm not saying dead people should be voting and I don't believe in voter fraud I, I mean I don't believe that's a good thing that's a tradition but but but, but, but <laughs> well there are a lot of things they do in Chicago we don't like to <laughs> adopt wide stream but I am saying you have to weigh that against these cyber concerns that Kat is talking about and when we talk about the cyber security breaches when we talk about cyber terrorism which we know is a very real thing I am tremendously concerned when the president talks about what are they worried about that's what I'm worried about that's what I'm worried oh, about, about too what your social security what? number is not what? public what you, information what? if it is you're living your life well, way wait, wrong wait, wait, wait. Yeah. What are you suggesting that by states turning over the information to this this panel that somehow that information is going to get hacked? Is that is that what we're concerned well, about? Well, yes, because they're talking about a portal, Eric. That's one of the ways they've requested the information the on the internet just go portal. Go to the state and hack the state. They can, if, yeah, if, exactly. If, if, they really probably want much to easier. Them. And by the way, this so is a concern because you know the Social Security Administration knows that fake Social Security numbers are used routinely. And I think the real underlying agenda issue here, especially for the left, is that this goes after the illegal alien problem as well. Because when you find out that you've got six people registered in six different states under the same Social Security number and all you had to do was match the lists up in a computer to find them and now you know who they are and you know their address the left says we don't want that to happen well Lars, i'm all with it if if someone can show me widespread voter fraud that warrants that type of risk that you're talking about then i will entertain it i haven't seen it i've seen a case here a case there but i've not seen this widespread pandemonium of voter fraud that i keep hearing about tommy i think voter id laws i'm with you I think so that'd that's be not a very... a, a, no answer for that one. I, I, I agree. I, well, to go to that extent, I, can tell I think you, you have to if you don't have voter ID laws. I think that you should have a photo ID to vote. I think that that should absolutely be. That would be a, such a simple way to go about this. And the people that are proposing that, Lars, because let's go back to this. Right. Um, what are they willing to do to offset the targeted groups of communities that are more adversely affected by How the are requirements? You more of, who I, I, I who gets data. through life just, without a driver's license what? or some kind of picture ID to cash checks? I had to use picture ID to check into a hotel. The reason they're not yep. finding it is all these all these states are not looking for it for the most part. And, and, Colorado. I believe that there's millions of, of, that's what President Trump said originally when he was a candidate, that there was millions of, of votes. No, I don't believe the number is yeah. that big, but I believe the number is large, and I think it's enough to change elections. And that's uh, what the whole reason for this was supposed to be, that millions, we've not seen that substantiated anywhere, uh, and I don't think we would, because I don't think that's the case. Ebony, I, I'd be willing to bet that in every state in this union, you can go and get a, a, an ID mm -hmm. for free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not even the whole problem. You're exactly right. Some people have transportation issues, Eric. Some people have. And, and this is just the truth that I've seen. Um, and I didn't want to test this theory because I got a lot of pushback oh, wait, on sorry. Twitter. So is it, is it, it racist, in house, like is a it hermit? racist or bigoted for any other of uh, the institutions yeah, that require did I an ID? Use any of those labels? No, 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 you didn't. You said there are communities that, that are, are adversely more, affected. more adversely affected. So they're older communities. There are people that don't have the transportation. People in those communities still have to use an ID to to do everything that Lars talked to, to live. To open so, a bank so what did I say? I said that's fine. What are those proponents willing to do to compensate that? That's all I'm asking. To make, make sure that make everybody it make it make it make, free and make it sure. easy. Make make it free. It as soon as I hear that legislation, I will consider <laughs> it with open arms. Straight ahead. <laughs> the juice gets squeezed. Nice. OJ Simpson is expected <laughs> to be cleared for parole tomorrow, but new financial and legal battles are looming if he steps free from prison. Stay tuned.
O.J. Simpson back in the limelight tomorrow as he faces a much-awaited parole hearing. And despite expectations that he'll likely get paroled, Simpson will certainly be slammed into financial and legal woes if he walks free from prison. Simpson currently owes the family of Ron Goldman, who was murdered along with Simpson's wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, back in 1994, tens of millions of dollars that stem from a wrongful death lawsuit that Simpson lost back in 97. And you can bet that the Goldman family is going to try to collect every red cent, especially if Simpson starts making serious loot when he comes out. Now, Eric, I know uh, that you, like many Americans in this country, feel like justice um, won't really be served if Simpson goes free, even at 70. But uh, he might. And there's two things that could happen. He uh, let him tell it will be looking for the real killer. You know, he's been saying that for years. But also... You know, I've heard it floated that he'll have a reality series. He oh, might going be making some big money from this. Big money. Forget the 25 grand per month from the NFL he's going to get. He's mm -hmm. got residuals from all those movies he had. And then all the new stuff. I mean, the first O.J. Simpson book. Are you mm -hmm. kidding me? It's of course. Gonna be six, seven digits. Six, seven, eight digits. Uh, who knows what the they seven advanced, digits. Yeah, yeah. Lots yeah, of digits. Yeah, lots of digits. But, 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 but yeah. can they attach? Can they go after I was going to say, of course post? they can. Yes, they can. And so maybe because until that debt is settled, Tommy, they are probably first in line, uh, the families of those uh, beneficiaries of the lawsuits from Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson, uh, to get that money. So maybe that's a good thing. Maybe although they'd prefer to see him locked up, at least they can uh, get some financial justice. Oh, absolutely. This. I mean, there's no doubt he's going to make a ton of money. But it's also on those that are upset that he's going to make so much money. I agree. But isn't that our fault? We have such a thirst for this. OJ, mm. to us, is just this mythical creature. And everyone wants to know. Everyone wants to watch the movies, read the books, read the magazine. So we're adding to his yeah. large I'll work. never pay a dime for a book. I think America, most Americans would be happy to see him locked up forever. Mm -hmm. The ERISA laws that protect his pension, I think it, it is about 25 a, a month, 25,000 a month, rich a by most people's standards. Yeah. And the Goldman family can't touch that so much. I hope they chase him all the way to his grave I for what they he would. did. Yeah. And by the way, he was not guilty in the criminal court, but he was found guilty. Liable. Li no, legally responsible for his wife's death in the civil court trial. So mm -hmm. uh, I hope they chase him down. Uh, th there is no amount. Uh, they're never going to get their pound of flesh out of O.J. Simpson, but I hope they keep trying. Okay. I have seen all the documentaries. I do use an ex-boyfriend's <laughs> HBO Go password, so I don't think <laughs> that I'm responsible. I hope you didn't hear that and change it. I don't think that I'm responsible for uh, any of this. But, yeah, you know what? And he's also a horrible narcissist, and no matter how much money he has, if people don't love him, then he's still not going to be happy. Uh, you know, in this crazy society, there will be people who love him. There, and people, people still think he's him. not uh, guilty. There will be guilty. women who yeah. still want to hook up with still, him. You <laughs> better believe it. They, oh, will no. still, they dated him afterwards. He had multiple girlfriends post acquittal of your wife's murder. Not the I new mean, news, though. My goodness. Oh, well, no, that, that, that was um, Unconfirmed. unilateral. Fake news. And, and fake news. <laughs> hashtag okay. fake news. But Lars, your callers, have they had any feedback on, because I had people split still saying they thought he was no, innocent. They, they hate him. And okay. I mean, I, I would look for, I asked for naysayers, I, I have a tough time finding anybody who'll defend anything that O.J. Simpson did from that point forward, and especially this, I'm going to go out and steal my property back from the people I gave it to. Yeah. That was ridiculous. And he, he had no idea, job. Tommy, that a gun or anything would be involved. You know, he was just none the wiser, lo and behold. I mean, because I thought that was pretty low down, because he was stealing back memorabilia that should have been auctioned off because he lost the lawsuit that Lars is talking mm -hmm. about, so he wouldn't even be man enough to settle up financially. I think all of us are in agreement about the morale of OJ Simpson. I think that we you know, I think we can all settle that, you know, you're anti-murder. Most yes. of us are anti OJ, but we're still fascinated by him. We're still going to mm. watch everything that he does. We're still going to wait tomorrow to see, you know, the verdict, what's going to happen. We're all going to sit there and we're all going to buy everything. We're all going to read everything because that's just how sick and twisted I, we I are. I will tell you, he'll have some agent knocking on his door, begging to, to represent him. If you're, Jim, if you're the guy, I'm firing you. Is that your <laughs> agent? Okay. <laughs> no, it's true, Eric. And you know what? I really think that this is not going to go any way anytime soon. This guy's 70 years old. And he. We, what we also know is when O.J. Simpson walks out of legal trouble, he doesn't, like, have a low profile, right? He just gets into this shine and this spotlight even more so. Yeah, if he doesn't have a reality show, he'll be on Instagram Live the whole time. Yeah, he'll which just is do it essentially himself. A, a reality yep. show uh, all its own. Do it yourself. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Well, when we circle back with our specialists, uh, Tommy Lauren and Lars Larson, in a moment, so stay with us.
All right, time to circle back with our specialists, Lars Larson and Tommy Lair. And Tommy, I'll start with you. I hear there's an upcoming event. You, Chelsea Handler, <laughs> tell me about that. Just a little one. I'm sure yeah. no one will be watching that, right? Not, what's it all about? <laughs> oh, Politicon. My second year at Politicon. I've got a couple of good debates, but I think the most anticipated is probably with uh, comedian Chelsea Handler. One-on-one -on -one debate? One-on-one. -on -one, we're calling it a conversation now. But, you know, she's a resistor. She, you know, planned to move if Trump were to be elected. And, right. you know, that didn't happen. She will be in Los Angeles with me <laughs> next weekend. And we're going to have a little talk. Cool. Um, awesome. Yeah, mine is for Lars. Um, you know, these kids these days, Lars, they're not working. They don't have summer jobs. I'm a bit disappointed. I started working very young. Uh, how old were you when you started in your radio day? Uh, I, uh, radio 16. That's I started 16 in a real radio station, the Mighty 1590, in a cow pasture, yeah. uh, but on the edge of town. But it was, and for the uh, federal minimum wage of a buck 85 an hour. And, it, and I'm sure you're making a little bit uh, more than that. I, I do. Nowadays. I got more hours. Right. So you see what hard work gets rate. you? I love it. Yeah. The radio station was in the cow pasture. It was in, on the edge of a cow pasture. In fact, the. I'm cows, thinking that might be a great podcast, actually. <laughs> they almost <laughs> brought down the yeah. tower because they like to scratch their backs on the tower guys. <laughs> So. Oh, that's wonderful. All right. So you, you said you just had a, a grandbaby? Well, I didn't one? have it. My daughter-in-law had it. You, you, you kind of do now. Now you do have one. Here's the thing. The single most beautiful granddaughter in the world, bar none. Aww. Six teeth, no hair, and totally beautiful. Which means she Pacing. will have a head full of hair. Because when babies, baby girls especially, have no hair their first year or two, they always have a head full of hair. She is very beautiful. Pace Congratulations. That's <laughs> very good. Great specialist today, guys. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so much for joining us. Thank you to our Fox News specialist, Tommy Laren and Lars Larson. And we thank all of you for watching. Make sure to follow us on social media. We love seeing you at Specialist FNC on both Twitter and Facebook. You know, our Facebook and Twitter pages are blowing up right now. You want to join those. Remember, 5 o'clock will never be the same. Brett Baer, special report who loves us, coming up <laughs> right now.